Hi, welcome to chapter 13. This is the central nervous system. We are going to be focusing primarily on the brain and brain stem. We only touch on the spinal cord a little bit. And then we also include a couple of reflexes, and that's why I think it's chapter 16 is included. Um, the book breaks up the nervous system differently than how I do. Um, the way I break it up is the way most books break it up, so I've kept it the way I have previously done it. Um, all right, so what do we care about? First, we want to know what the cerebrum is versus the rest of the brain. And this we kind of already know, um, right? So it's all this stuff here. Um, I don't know if corpus callosum is considered part of the cerebrum or not. Uh, and on here, um, there may be some debate over this, but I did check a couple sources. Um, and it seems like everything that I just highlighted, including these sort of multicolored areas here, are all considered part of the cerebrum. We are going to concentrate primarily on the outer layer of the cerebrum, and we're not, not going to talk about parts like the globus pallidus, the caudate, or the putamen. And we just kind of skip over those. Uh, so the first thing then to know about the cerebrum is that you can divide it up between gray matter and white matter. Um, white matter is anywhere there are myelinated axons, and then gray matter is anywhere there are cell bodies or unmyelinated axons. As far as I know, there are no unmyelinated axons in the brain. There are in the spinal cord. That's your gray commissure. Um, but we're not going to worry about that. We're going to consider gray matter to be cell bodies and white matter to be myelinated axons. Which what that means for us is, right, white matter is information transmission lines going from one region to another region. And then the gray matter is where integration takes happen, where um, nervous signals end up and also where they originate from and end up getting relayed somewhere else. Um, so those are, again, the integration centers. So starting on the outside, just this layer here, I thought this was going to show up. Apparently I needed darker green. All right, th this part right here, that thickness, um, that is the cerebral cortex, 2 to 4 millimeters of gray matter. This is where most of the conscious thought um, perception and conscious, conscious voluntary motor control originates in the cortex. Um, again, these regions down here are also considered gray matter. They're part of your cerebrum. They play a role in a lot of different things, including both motor control and uh, this part right here, if my neuroanatomy is correct, that is your amygdala. Um, and it is where fear and anger, among other emotions, are generated, but primarily fear and anger. And it also allows you to understand or read emotions on other people's faces. It doesn't allow you to recognize the face. There's a whole different part of the brain that does that. Um, so then back to just talking about the way the cerebral cortex works. Now, the first thing we need to know is that there is this thing called lateralization, which means the two sides of your brain don't necessarily do the same thing. Um, and then there's this other phenomenon called cerebral dominance, where one hemisphere is more dominant than the other hemisphere. Um, you do have primary motor cortex in both of your hemispheres. One of them is stronger than the other, um, so that hemisphere is what leads to being right-handed or left-handed. Um, and because your motor axons cross over the midline in the medulla oblongata, that is the decussation of pyramid fibers, didn't you want to know that? Um, that means that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. So if you are right-handed, you are not in your right mind, you're in your left mind, so to speak. 
Yeah. So the way it usually happens, the way the lateralization usually breaks now down in most people, but not always, is that the left hemisphere is for logic. Um, so language, math, and logic. When they mean language, they mean the literal interpretation of language. Um, without the right hemisphere, somebody might not understand sarcasm or a joke. They'll be able to read a book and follow instructions, but the left hemisphere doesn't necessarily understand that somebody's kidding or being sarcastic. Um, so again, that's the, the literal meaning of language comes from the left hemisphere. And then the right hemisphere is more involved in, as this says here, insight, visual, spatial skills, intuition. Um, this is why a lot of artistic people tend to be left hand, excuse me, le yeah, left handed. So right brain dominant, they're better at visual, spatial skills, artistic skills, intuition, and they are then left handed. Um, I say that it doesn't always break down this way. Um, some people have a flip flop where the left hemisphere is the artistic spatial skills and the right hemisphere is math and logic. Um, I uh, had a, a friend who was a left-handed mathematician. She was extremely logical to the point of being difficult to understand sometimes because she didn't have a well-developed sense of humor. Not that all mathematicians don't, she just didn't. Um, moving right along, you don't care about my left-handed mathematician friend. Uh, let's see, we are going to go over different kinds of regions of the cerebral cortex, uh, motor areas, sensory areas, association areas. We'll talk about each of them when we get closer to them. I will say that the way we cover the brain oversimplifies it to a large extent and makes it sound like each part of the brain is responsible for doing one thing. Um, and there are a lot of delegation of tasks within the brain that are location specific, but consciousness, complex thoughts and emotions, really the things that make us human are much more distributed. So multiple parts of the brain or multiple circuits spread throughout the brain are working together to help us generate thoughts and that's really where our personality comes from is all the different parts of the brain and how they interact. So we're going to go over three motor areas, your primary motor cortex, your premotor cortex, and Broca's area. Uh, so first up is your primary motor cortex. Um, it is located, as this says, in the precentral gyrus. Um, you want to know for all of these brain areas, where they're located and what they do. Um, so right there is your precentral gyrus, so the very posterior border of your parietal lobe. Um, that again is where your primary motor cortex is located. This is where all of your conscious motor signals or motor instructions originate in your primary motor cortex. So the neurons from here run down through your brain and down into your spinal cord, and then they activate the motor neurons in the ventral horn of your spinal cord and initiate voluntary motor control of skeletal muscle. Um, so what you need to know about this is, as this says right here, um, really it's two things. One is that your body is kind of mapped out on your brain, which to a certain extent just makes sense, right? The, the part of your brain that controls your foot is close to the part of your brain which controls your ankle and close to the part of your brain which controls your knee. It doesn't have to be this way, but it just kind of makes sense that it would be. You do have some special areas for your face, and I'm not sure what that is. If memory serves, that might be genitalia. Um... Then the other thing is that you have a larger area of cortex dedicated to the parts of your body where you have greater coordination. Um, this is because those areas have small muscles and small motor units so that they have fine control over movement and force. 
that control means there necessarily has to be more cortical neurons. Um, so over here, I've just sort of drawn a picture to remind you, right? If this motor neuron right here represents one motor unit, that's a unit of control, then there has to be one motor neuron in the cortex to control it. So if you have more motor units, you need more motor neurons, and then you're going to have a greater area of the cortex dedicated to that part of the body. This goofy little picture here is called a homunculus. Um, and it, it's similar, you can see, to the homunculus that's mapped out on the brain there. Each part of the body is sized in proportion to how much of the cortex is dedicated to it. So you can see that lips and tongue and hands get a whole lot of cortical space dedicated to them because we need very fine control over our hands as tool users um, so that you can type and write and fix your car or your bike or whatever. Um, and then facial expression, uh, muscles of speech and muscles of swallowing, those are all very important complicated muscles, right? Performing speech is a complicated motor movement that you have to do properly, which requires a lot of uh, coordination, as well as coordinating facial expression. It's not something that we think about all that much, but it is a huge part of being the social animals that we are. We all make similar facial expressions across cultures, and we all read each other's facial expressions, so we have to be able to make facial expressions accurately so that we're all communicating the same way with our faces. Then uh, you get to the premotor cortex. It is right here. They don't really point it out. Um, well, they call it the motor association area. Um, I always draw it higher up, but maybe it's this low, who knows. Um, but it's just in front of the primary motor cortex. Um, this helps you do learned, repetitious, or patterned motor skills. So think typing, texting, um, things that you do mostly with your hands, but uh, you know can be your whole body that you tend not to learn about, or excuse me, you tend not to think about. Yeah. I was looking at planning on the screen and thinking about learning as I said that. Yeah. And we'll also, when we go over the cerebellum, we'll talk about um, that the premotor cortex communicates with the cerebellum, and that has to do with this incorporation of sensory feedback that's listed there. Um, then you have Broca's area. Uh, as I understand it, Wernicke's area is not necessarily a motor area, as it says here. It's an association area, which means it works with another area. Um, but Broca's area is a special motor area that controls the muscles that are responsible for speech. And it's hooked up to Wernicke's area because Wernicke's area is dedicated to understanding how words sound. Um, and so Broca's area was originally thought to be more of a cognitive area to understand what words mean because it would be active when people were speaking. Um, but it just turns out that, that it's a motor area. It is not necessarily a cognitive area, um, which also means, right, for a lot of people that can't speak, and I think most of us know this, um, just because you can't speak doesn't mean you don't under, understand language. It might just mean that you don't have the motor skills to do it, but you still have the cognitive capacity to understand and use language. Uh, moving right along, then we get to the sensory areas. There are a lot of them. And again, remember, if there's a space written down, be able to know what the function is. I'm not going to ask you exactly where Broca's area is located because I haven't described it. Um, but most of these areas will have a location. Uh, first up, primary somatosensory cortex. That's this dark part right here in your post-central gyrus, so the very anterior portion of your occipital lobe. Um, this is where all of your general sensation is, uh, what's the word, perceived by your brain. So everything coming from skin, skeletal muscles, and joints. 
So hot, cold, touch, um, and stretch receptors, proprioceptors that are located in your muscles and joints that let your body know which muscles are stretched and which are contracted and how much tension there is across your joints. Um, so that then, if you take all of the information from skeletal muscles and joints, it gives your brain an idea of where your body or your body's position in space. Right? If you know which muscle is straight and which muscle is contracted, then you know which joints are flexed and which joints are extended. Uh, moving right along, this is very much like the motor cortex. Those parts of your body that are more sensitive have more sensory neurons in them, which means there then have to be more sensory neurons or cortical neurons in the brain to receive input from that part of the body. So those parts of the body that are more sensitive have a larger region of the cortex dedicated to them. And not surprisingly, it's the same parts of the body that have a lot of fine motor control also have a lot of sensitivity. This is because your brain needs sensory feedback in order to know whether or not it's performing the right motor function. Um, so there's almost always a one-to-one -one relationship or a tight relationship between motor control and how much sensory input you get from that area. The only place where it's a little bit different right, is the genital region, which is highly sensitive but doesn't have a ton of muscles in it. So it would have more uh, sensory cortex dedicated to it than motor cortex. Um, oh, so next one, I forgot primary visual cortex that is located right there um, in the very back of your occipital lobe and this is where raw data about visual information is perceived by your brain i'm not going to say interpreted because association areas are what actually do the interpretation and we'll get to that uh, then you have your primary auditory cortex. It is right here in the top of your temporal lobe. Um, and this just is information about hearing. Now we'll move on. Primary olfactory cortex is also the temporal lobe, but it's the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. Um, and this is your conscious perception of odor or smell. Then your gustatory cortex is located here in a region of the cortex which is actually buried. So it's called the insula, like insulation is found inside something. The insula is sort of buried deep in the hemisphere, but it is still cortex. And this is for your conscious perception of taste. Um, then you have association areas. Um, which we're not going to go into really all the different association areas, but you want to know that you have one for every major sensory area. Like you, here's your primary visual cortex, here's your visual association area, auditory cortex, auditory association area, um, primary somatosensory association area. So what your association areas do is link perception with memory. So they take the sound, compare it to memories of sound, and say, oh, that's a car starting, that's my mother's voice, that's a cat. Um, I was going to say something wise about cats, but I won't. Um, so yeah, your, it's your association areas that allow you to understand your sensations. Your other regions just get raw data on them, but they don't necessarily understand them. Um, talking then about association areas is our segue into different fiber tracks um, because that is how your brain is connected up. So first up is just projection fibers. They carry information up and down the spinal cord. So like a sensory neuron would come all the way up here to the, what is that called, the thalamus and dump neurotransmitter onto another 
um, neuron that would then project to the sensory cortex. Um, so these would be projection fibers. Association fibers, as it says here, link different parts of the brain in the same hemisphere. So it might allow this part of the brain to communicate with that part of the brain. Or if you're thinking about the way your association areas work, it would be this part of the brain with that part of the brain, or you know these these links here, um, front to back, or over here like left to right, hooking up different parts of the cortex. And then commissures cross the midline, so your corpus callosum would be a great big band of commissural fibers that connect your right hemisphere to your left hemisphere. Um, so that was a quick sidetrack into different kinds of fiber tracks. Then we get back to different areas and our next one is the one association area that we are going to talk about specifically um, which is the prefrontal cortex. So you do want to think of it as an association area. It's hooked up to a lot of different parts of your brain so in terms of the wiring, when, when this says most complicated, that means it has the most connections to other parts of the cortex or um, also the, uh, the subcortical regions that we were talking about, those basal ganglia like the caudate and the amygdala that I pointed out are going to have connections to the prefrontal cortex. Um, so it is involved in what I call, and I think other people call, I got this from somebody, executive function. Um, so not just smarts, like as it says here, intellect and cognition, um, but it allowed you to focus and regulate um, where reasoning and judgment, as it says here, come from. So it's kind of the part of your brain that helps tamp down emotion so that you can rely more on judgment and reasoning. The judgment or reasoning may not necessarily happen there. You need your whole brain for that. But it's your prefrontal cortex that kind of coordinates everything so that your brain works the way you want it to to function better in the world. Now, this is an interesting story about the prefrontal cortex. This is Phineas T. Gage, who received the world's first documented accidental prefrontal lobotomy. That's a mouthful. Uh, he was a railroad worker. He had or was working with a large iron rod, a tamping rod. He was packing explosives down into a hole that would have been drilled to blow a hole through a mountain so they could run the rail lines. Um, and the explosives, I don't know if it was a whole lot of dynamite or just blasting caps, went off and it shot the rail, as you can see here, up through his skull. It went in just behind the zygomatic bone there, um, behind his eye. Miss, I don't know if it missed his optic nerve or not. It looks like his eye eventually just went shut. Um, but it went right through his cortex. Um, this is an artist's recreation of the skull. I think that's his actual skull, or maybe just a recreation of it. Um, and then over here is a computer-generated image of the parts of his brain that most likely would have been damaged by the tamping rod. And you can see it's mostly left side and some of the right side of his prefrontal cortex that was damaged. Um, as you can tell from the picture here, he survived. He walked away from this accident, or walked away eventually. But he was never quite the same afterwards. Um, according to this description, he does actually is able to hold down a job, but was not quite as stable, quite as reliable, um, quite as calm as he used to be. He just got into a little bit more trouble, was more prone to get into fights, um, again, because his emotions would get the better of him because his prefrontal cortex wasn't sort of keeping everything in check. Um, and then this guy here, he's a jerk. Um, him, we don't like him. Uh, this is Dr. Walter Friedman. He developed a technique called transorbital frontal lobotomy. Um, I don't know why I include him. I heard a radio show about him one time and I thought it was an interesting, if not alarming and scary story. Uh, he was a physician. I don't know what his degree was in, like what kind of physician, but he was a doctor. 
Um, and he developed this technique where, I don't know if you can see, he's got what looks like a reflex hammer almost, but no, it's metal, so it's not a reflex hammer. He's got a little hammer, and he takes what looks like an ice pick and puts it under the patient's eyelid and then taps, taps, taps on the pick to get through the very thin bones of the orbit and then slides the ice pick looking thing into the frontal lobe and scrambles the frontal lobe on one side then slides it under the other eyelid tap 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 scrambles the frontal lobe on the other side um, he did this a lot he lost his license to practice medicine after sort of people realized oh my god why are you lobotomizing everybody um, postpartum depression adhd um, all sorts of manageable mental health issues um, he would perform transorbital frontal lobotomies for. Yeah. Moving right along, so now we are out of the cerebrum, that was quick, um, and on to the diencephalon, thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. We will start with the thalamus, and as it says right here, this is a relay station for sensation. Um, so all of your senses, with the exception of smell, because they evolutionarily predate the thalamus, um, all of your other senses pass through the thalamus on the way to the cortex. So here you have a, an interneuron that is part of a sensory pathway that is going up the spinal cord, and you can see it goes into the brain. It's going to dump neurotransmitter onto this purple neuron, and then the purple neuron is going to dump neurotransmitter onto a cortical neuron, which is then responsible for perceiving whatever stimulus was felt at the surface of the body. Um, so sight, taste, I think, um, definitely sound um, and balance. All of your other senses pass through the thalamus, just not smell. Um, that goes directly from your, um, I can't say, olfactory lobe, which is not part of your brain, it's, it's like the, the bulb in your skull, to the olfactory cortex. So it is part of the brain, but it's not part of the cortex. Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Then we are on to the hypothalamus. That is just below the thalamus, so that region there. Um, this is, as it says right here, your major, major autonomic control or integration center. Um, I cannot overstress the importance or the number of different things that the hypothalamus has control over. So autonomic nervous system is all the stuff that you don't think about, like reproduction. I mean, you think about it, but you don't consciously control um, a lot of the neural circuits involved in reproduction digestion, um, heart rate, breathing to a certain extent, um, all sorts of things are controlled by the hypothalamus. And in addition to being the primary integration center for your autonomic nervous system, it also controls a lot of your hormones by controlling the pituitary. So a lot of people will refer to the pituitary as the master endocrine gland, but the pituitary is under the control of the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus controls a good portion of your endocrine system. There are hormones and endocrine organs that operate independently of the hypothalamus. Um, but your thyroid, your adrenal glands, and ovaries and testes are all under the control of the hypothalamus. So next up is the epithalamus, which we're just going to call the pineal gland. Technically, the epithalamus is more than just the pineal gland. Um, as this says here, this secretes melatonin. Melatonin helps you fall asleep. Um, so the way it works is that your thalamus gets input from your retina and then tells the hypothalamus when light is hitting the retina and it in turn, your hypothalamus turns your pineal gland off in the presence of light, so your melatonin levels go down. And then when it gets dark, um, your thalamus um, relays that information to your hypothalamus, and then your hypothalamus 
stops inhibiting your pineal gland and you start releasing melatonin and it's when your melatonin levels go up that you get sleepy and you're able to fall asleep. Um, this is why people will tell you not to spend too much time on your phone or your tablet before going to bed because they produce a lot of blue light that stimulates your thalamus which ultimately inhibits melatonin secretion so you find it hard to fall asleep. Um, so, you know, put your phone down before you go to bed or, you know, buy melatonin supplements and try those out. Um, next up then is the midbrain. There's actually a lot going on in the midbrain. Um, there are some reflex centers there. Um, so this this would then be leading to um, i think it's your accessory nerve so when your head twists left or right in response to loud sounds or something happening in your visual field that's um, visual and auditory reflexes um, it's also where your substantia nigra is um, which if that dies off that is what leads to parkinson's disease um, so I don't know if you're familiar with Parkinson's. That is the people that have tremors. They have these involuntary skeletal muscle movements or contractions. Um, so the substantia nigra inhibits improper movements. And without it, you get these involuntary tremors. We would like to think that our brain functions such that in lieu of in lieu of, in the absence of any voluntary motor commands, the body would stay still, but you, you need some part of your brain to keep your body still so that only voluntary motor commands are what travel down your spinal cord. Uh, then you have the pons. There's a lot that goes on in the pons, but we are going to think of the pons as being primarily, control, or primarily concerned with controlling your breathing because um, we don't have time to get into everything. Yeah. Then the medulla does a lot. As it says right here, it carries out orders for the hypothalamus. Um, so it can affect uh, digestion, sexual function, uh, heart rate, a whole lot of different things. And then it also does have what is called the cardiovascular center, which is independent of autonomic nervous system which regulates heart rate, blood vessel diameter, um, and that helps regulate your blood pressure. Um, so there's a lot that goes on in the medulla, and we won't really necessarily talk about it. Um, the way I differentiate them is that the medulla has direct control over a lot of things, and then the hypothalamus has indirect control. So the hypothalamus will relay autonomic instructions to the medulla, and then the medulla will relay autonomic instructions to target organs, uh, primarily through your vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. Um, let's see, then we are on to the cerebellum. Um, the role that it plays in equilibrium, I'm not really sure about, or I'm not sure how to explain, I should say. Uh, but this part here where it says corrects movement with up-to-date sensory information, this is where the cerebellum is communicating with your premotor cortex and refining your motor plan before your primary motor cortex actually goes ahead and gives the signal for muscles to contract. The best example of when something like this, something like this would be happening is if you're playing baseball or football, right, and the ball is thrown or hit to you and you have to run it down. Um, you are constantly tracking the ball as it's flying and trying to figure out if you're running at the right speed and the right direction to be under the ball when it hits the ground. So you need to run faster or slower or change your direction. Um, all of that updating of your stride based on what you see is done in consultation with your cerebellum. I just said in consultation with. I feel so smart. Uh, let's see. Now, deep breath, we're 34 minutes in, um, probably stop soon just so that this whole thing isn't like an hour. Um, uh, up until this point, every thing we have talked about has been one discrete part of the brain, a, a cortical region, 
a part of your diencephalon or your cerebellum. Here we have two different brain systems, so multiple structures distributed either throughout your brainstem or through your cerebrum that perform more complicated functions. First up is the limbic system. You want to know first what the parts of the limbic system are. They are listed here. Um, the amygdala that we talked about earlier is right here, um, which is basically at the end of the hippocampus there. Yeah. So your amygdala helps generate feelings of anger or fear, um, quite often by seeing angry and fearful expressions on other people's faces. Um, so it is hooked up to your olfactory lobe and your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is involved in memory formation. Um, so it is thought that the memories themselves reside in the cortex but your hippocampus works with different parts of the cortex to solidify memory, to form long-term memories. So if you just look at these structures and think about all of them being connected, what your limbic system is doing is integrating memory, emotion, and sensation, primarily smell. Um, and this is why we have such good smell memories and why emotion plays such a big role in memory. Like we usually um, have vivid memories of very emotional times in our lives because of that connection. And we also tend to remember lots of different smells and tastes, especially if it's something that made us sick, right? This is a survival mechanism here. If you eat something once, um, back in the days of being a hunter-gatherer before, you know, we had labels on foods in the supermarket. Um, you wanted to remember if something made you sick so that you wouldn't eat it again. And this connection between smell, emotion, and memory is what solidifies that so that you don't eat that thing that made you sick again. Um, and so it's where all of those associations come from. You know, if you wake up and you smell tamales, you might think Christmas or maybe Christmas cookies. Um, or if you wake up and you smell the turkey, you think it's Thanksgiving, whatever it is. Smells bring back memories. Uh, next up is the reticular formation, which as this says right here, is three broad columns of gray matter, um, but they also make connections to the cortex. Um, so there are axons that go project up into many different regions of the cortex. Our book does not have a good picture of the reticular formation. And this is the only picture I could find that was not copyrighted. Um, this is, I think that language is, um, well, I think that alphabet is Cyrillic. I have no idea what the language is. Um, it looks like Russian, but it could be anything because I don't know. Um, at any rate, the reticular, activate, the reticular formation or reticular activating system, I think of as the simple sim, the system that helps you concentrate. Um, so it filters out repetitive stimuli or weak stimuli, um, and um, it keeps your cerebral cortex awake and alert. Um, and those two things are what you need to do to concentrate. So you need to not get distracted by the feeling of your clothes on your skin or the ticking of the clock or the running of the refrigerator and you need to be able to focus and think. Um, that's what your reticular activating system does. Um, I personally think that this is why a lot of people like to have some background noise when they're studying because if it's constant repetitive noise like white noise your reticular activating system is going to filter that out. And then at the same time, it'll filter out more of the incidental noises like somebody's voice or, you know, the, I don't know, the heat turning on and off. Like if you have a fan on next to you the whole time and the heat turns off, you're not gonna notice it's quiet all of a sudden. Um, so some people like to have a little bit of constant noise in the background because then all of the intermittent noises don't bother them and as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is why. If you do want noise in the background, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Mozart effect, uh, which is if you play music for babies, it makes them smarter. It doesn't. Um, this comes from some research that I think was done in Germany, but don't quote me on that. 
um, where they played music while people were trying to learn things. And if they had played, I think it was Baroque music, um, people learned better. And it was not because it was good music, but if, if you've ever compared Baroque to, say, classical, Baroque music is, is very, um, how should I put it? It's not very dynamic. This is before piano and loud brass instruments. So it just um, complicated, but not big changes in volume. So it is something that your brain could just sort of tune out. Um, so if you have, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, non-lyrical music and probably music that you don't love don't pick like your favorite music um, but if you play something musically complicated that your brain has a hard time following or predicting what's going to happen next um, because we're just used to understanding the way music works we can feel when the chorus is going to come back in a pop song we know what chords sound good next all of that stuff um, but the more complicated music, like Baroque music or jazz, certain kinds of jazz, um, are just more difficult for your brain to predict. And if you have that playing in the background, it can help you concentrate, or at least it works for me. Um, I am going to leave it there, and we'll do the rest in a separate screencast, which will be probably much shorter than this one.